and welcome to the world today. I'm Hona live from Beijing. Our top story this hour, China's State Council Information Office is briefing the media on the country's financial work and economic development. Let's go live to the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to today's State Council Information Office press conference. Today we are happy to have with us Governor of the PBOC, Mr. Pang Gongshen, Deputy Governor of the PBOC and Administrator of the State Administration of Foreign, Affairs, of Foreign Exchange, Mr. Zhu Hexing, and Deputy Governor of the PBOC, Mr. Xuan Changnen. They will talk on implementing decisions of the Central Economic Work Conference and providing financial support for the high quality development of the real economy. Now we first give the floor to Mr. Governor. Thank you, moderator, friends from the press, good afternoon. I'm very happy to join you this afternoon with the two deputy governors. I'm glad to have the opportunity to also take your questions later. First of all, I wish to thank all of you here for your interest in, for your interest in and coverage of China's reform and development of the financial sector and work related to the PBOC and the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. The CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at its core attaches high importance to work related to the financial sector. At the Central Financial Work Conference held in 2023, President Xi emphasized the need to adhere to the path to financial development with Chinese characteristics, advance the high quality development of the financial sector, and build China into a country with a strong financial financial sector. During the Central Economic Work Conference, overall requirements, policy orientation and priorities have been set out for economic work in 2024. Recently, during a study session on promoting high-quality financial development attended by provincial and ministerial level officials, President Xi Jinping made further instructions for current and future periods on relevant work. The PBOC and the state administration of foreign exchange will continue to act with professionalism and pragmatism to implement the decisions of the CPC Central Committee, continue to serve the development of the real economy through the financial sector, step up macro management, counter cyclical and cross cyclical adjustments, continue to enhance the momentum of China's economic rebound and improvement and continue to contribute to high quality economic growth. In 2024, we will focus on the following priorities. First, to stay committed to a prudent monetary policy and make sure that these policies are flexible, moderate, precise and effective and continue to provide a sound monetary and financial environment for the real economy. Over the past year, we've strengthened counter-cyclical cyclical adjustment as needed and cut twice the reserve requirement ratio and the policy interest rate. We've guided the orderly reduction of existing first home loans and guided financial institutions to keep credit scale at a moderate level and progress has been made, good progress has been made in this regard. In 2024, in terms of the aggregate, we will put into use a variety of policy tools, keep liquidity ample and reasonable, and make the scale of social financing and monetary supply consistent with price expectations and economic growth rate. In terms of pace, we will ensure a balanced lending of credit and continue to make credit increase stable. In terms of structure, we will leverage financial resources that remain inefficient and continue to provide stronger support to private and small and micro businesses and we will implement the 25 measures on supporting the growth of, of the real economy which was issued recently. At the same time, we will fully leverage the unused existing fund. And in terms of prices, we will take a balanced approach of both internal external factors, steadily lower the overall financing cost and keep RMB exchange rate generally stable at an adaptive and balanced level. Second, we will provide stronger support in the areas 
in areas of strategic importance and key sectors and weak things and focus on five aspects of financial sector in 2023. We've worked to unleash the role of monetary policy to adjust economic structure, upgrade sectors and shift from old to new drivers. We've guided financial institutions to provide stronger lending support and higher than average loans have been provided to micro businesses to the medium and long-term development of the, of the manufacturing sector and to green loans going forward we will leverage both the quantity and structure of monetary policies and continue to channel financial resources to facilitate science and technology advances, green growth, development of a mutually beneficial financial sector, the aging industry, and the digital economy, which are the five key areas. Upon approval by the CPC Central Committee, the PBOC will establish a credit market department to focus on work related in these five areas. Third, we will take steady measures to diffuse risks in the financial sector. This is a eternal theme of our work, and right now, China's financial risks are generally under control. The operation is steady, and expectations are stable. Going forward, we will strengthen the monetary pre-warning and evaluation of financial risks and work to build a financial risk disposal mechanism with equal rights and incentives and constraints. In accordance with market-based and law-based principles, we will work with local governments and relative departments to steadily diffuse risks in key areas and facing key institutions and continue to improve the safety net in the financial sector and also work on the legislative front to keep the financial sector stable. Fourth, we will continue to deepen financial reform and open up. On opening on reform, we will further deepen relative reform and work to build a well-regulated, transparent, open and dynamic and resilient financial sector. We will continue to upgrade the financial structure, market provide better market entities with uh, provide market entities with better services and uh, products and also advance the development of the credit and payment market on high standard opening up we will continue to deepen institution opening up in the financial sector, strengthen the connectivity of both foreign and domestic financial markets, steadily advance the internationalization of RMB, and support Hong Kong and uh, Shanghai to become more competitive as international financial hubs. Fifth, we will actively participate in global financial governance and cooperation. We will continue to practice multilateralism, increase dialogue and communication, and make good use of a number of platforms, including the G20, the IMF, the Bank for International Settlements, and co better coordinate with global macroeconomic and financial policies. We will deliver on the consensus reached during the San Francisco Presidential Summit and make sure that sound work are done under the China, U.S. and China, EU financial working groups. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. We firmly believe that under the leadership of the CPC Central Committee with President Xi Jinping, with Commerce Xi Jinping at its core, we will make steady progress on the path of financial development with Chinese characteristics and make our contribution to national rejuvenation through Chinese modernization. So these are my opening remarks, and now I'll give the floor to questions. Thank you, Governor Pan. Now we will go into the Q&A session. Please identify yourself before asking questions. Thank you. First question, please. Thank you. We're CNBC. My question is, if the Fed does not raise interest rates this year, will this mean greater monetary policy adjustment room for the PBOC? Thank you for your question. Every day when I go to work, I read news from the CNBC. I often, I usually read your news for half an hour before I start working. Uh, there are now a lot of interest on the issue you raised. A lot of experts are also discussing that, so thank you for the question. Now all sides are paying very close attention to whether Fed and other central banks will change their monetary policies in 2024, and China is doing the same. We know that starting from March 2023, Fed started its interest rate hikes. And so far, the policy interest rates in the United States went up 200 
25 basic points, reaching 5.25% to 5.5%. The European Central Bank also raised interest rates for 10 consecutive times, and now the refinancing rate in Europe went up from 0% to 4.5%. So we see that the interest rate right now in the US and Europe are both at historical high. Such rapid interest rate hikes are now having a growing spillover effect into the economic growth, inflation, and the financial market of these economies. Market expectation is that in 2024, both the Fed and the ECB may lower their interest rate. So overall, we are now seeing signs of adjusting monetary policies by the Fed in 2024. Over the past year, due to the Market expectations because of uh, the U.S. policy interest rates change have led to fluctuations in the U.S. interest rate. We know that in 2022, the U.S. dollar index once rose to as high as 114, the highest in 2020 the highest since 2002, and over 2023, the dollar index remained at above 100, and recently it has been hovering at around 103. The U.S. dollar exchange rates has a high correlation with policy interest rate expectations, so as the Fed and as the Fed and raising interest rates. Market expectation is that the momentum for the dollar index to further strengthen now has been weakened. As of the policy adjustments from the Fed, how would that affect the U.S. policy interest rate and how would that affect China's monetary policy? On China's part, we've always been putting China first in implementing our monetary policy, and at the same time, we've taken into account both internal and external factors. In 2023, amid the spillover effect of um, developed economies, the PBOC has based our policies on our domestic economic development. We have twice cut our policy interest rates and RRR ratio, thus ensuring ample liquidity on the market. We've also improved the credit structure, which has strongly supported the real economy. At the same time, the PBOC and the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, in light of the supply and demand of the forex markets, we've lowered forex deposit reserve ratio, and we've taken a number of measures, such as raising the micro prudential adjustment parameters for cross-border financing. This has helped stabilize market expectations. So overall, we believe in 2024, the spillover effect of the monetary policies of developed countries will exert a lesser pressure on other economies. The policy cycle gap between China and the U.S., will tend to converge in 2024 as well. So such a change in the external environment will help increase the autonomy for adjusting China's monetary policy and increase space for our policy maneuver. Thank you. Next question, please. With China Daily, the Central Economic World Conference stressed the need to focus both on high quality development and high level security to deepen reform in key areas and consolidate the fundamentals of the foreign trade and investment. So what's your point of view on the cross-border capital flow going forward? As I have mentioned, the changes of environment in and outside of China has some influence on China's forex market, but we maintain basic stability in that respect. I would like to invite Mr. Zhu to answer your question. Thank you for your question. Just now, Governor Pan has given a summary on your question. I will build on that. Over the past year, we have conquered many 
difficulties, according to our statistics. China's cross-border capital flows have become more stable recently. We have uh, current account seen inflow. We see about 280 billion yuan, including 600 billion yuan of trade in goods. Foreign investment in China is showing a good momentum since September for four months. Foreign investors are holding more bonds in China. Over 450 billion RMB yuan. Based on that, in 2024, we predict that we will have more stable cross border capital flow. And we will see foreign capital inflows under the capital account become more active. We have quite complete industrial chains, and we are upgrading our industry. We have a strong capacity of manufacturing, making our trading goods competitive. Uh, we are developing diverse markets, and our regional cooperation policy is delivering effects. Market entities are growing in numbers and our products are becoming more competitive. We are working with more countries and regions, and this will provide stability for us in this regard. Now, uh, in terms of capital account inflow, we also predict that in 2024, there will be some changes in the Fed's policy. Just now, Governor Pan mentioned that the external pressure will be lower, and this will provide us with easier environment. And we look forward to rising foreign investment. In recent years, the value of diversified and decentralized investment of RMB assets has become more prominent. We are fully confident about that. And your second question was about facilitation. We combine high-quality development and security. We will continue to reform and provide more facilitation to serve the real economy, to serve economic recovery and consolidate the growth momentum. We will focus on the following five aspects. First, we will focus on actively promote cross-border trade and facilitate investment and financing. We focus on supporting technology, innovation, and serving small, medium, and micro enterprises. We will expand the coverage of these policies, and we will also facilitate cross-border financing by solving problems for medium and small-sized enterprises. Now, people have greater interest in terms of cross-border e-commerce and other new trading forms. And how can we support their development? That is the issue we have in our mind. SciTech firms, we also need to facilitate them in terms of uh, cross-border financing. To get them off to a good start by giving them support in terms of uh, foreign exchange policy risk prevention, we will take more proactive stance in that. If we do not do a good job in terms of uh, managing, Exchange rate, there will be more issues. We have uh, issued nine measures in terms of cross-border trade, investment, and financing. 
How can we implement those policies and further evaluate them to adapt them, make them more sensitive to the demands of enterprises so that uh, they can really feel the facilitation and feel that it's easier for them to do business. And secondly, we will focus on high quality institutional opening up. And uh, we will steadily expand pilot program for high level opening up of cross border trade and investment and improve the pilot program for integrated domestic and foreign currency capital pooling business of multinational companies. My old company also needs such pilot programs as well. We continue to support regional opening up and innovation and promote connectivity between financial markets in and outside China and to attract more foreign invested financial institutions and long-term capital to start business uh, in China. And uh, the third area will be R&B internationalization. We see the proportion of cross-border R&B uh, payment in trading goods has been increased to 25%. Percent, the highest in recent years. Uh, we will focus on trade and investment facilitation, strengthen domestic and foreign currency synergy, and further improve cross-border RMB-related policies and infrastructure, and uh, better meet the needs of overseas investors in allocating holding RMB assets and risk hedging. And uh, we will continue to support steady development of the offshore RMB market and strengthen the hub function of Hong Kong's offshore RMB market. And fourth, we will focus on improving our management. And on the one hand, we will improve the monitoring, early warning and response mechanism for cross-border capital flows, strengthen market communication and expectation guidance. And uh, on the other hand, we will also strengthen full coverage of supervision in foreign exchange uh, field and to deal with abnormal situation very timely. You might notice that we have recently introduced management measures for banks' foreign exchange business development. One of the core issues is about diligence, due diligence and exemption. We have reflected that in this new measure as well. And we hope that more banks will join this system to enhance facilitation and better serve market entities. And the last area would be to improve uh, the operation and management of foreign exchange reserves with Chinese characteristics to ensure its safety, flow, and value preservation and appreciation. Next question, please. With Reuters, last year, China maintained low inflation. Sometimes CPI and PPI went down together. There were some worries in the market about deflation. What will be the price levels this year, and what measures will be taken to deal with the possible deflation? Thank you. With, uh, with Reuters. Thank you for your question. About price level, many people are interested in that. I would like to share with you some of my views. Uh, we, when we discuss this issue, I think we need to maybe from different channels, from media, from the academia, you will see different discussions. I believe that we need to take a broader view and to take into account a longer time span to see this issue. Taking into account the situation over the past year, how the major economies are doing and how China has been doing in terms of prices 
what was, has been the trajectory and the logic behind the changes of prices. We need to understand from a global vision over the past years how prices have changed in global market and in uh, global economies and in China. When the pandemic broke out years ago to effectively respond to the crisis, the world's major economies generally implemented easy fiscal and monetary policies. At the same time, the pandemic had a great impact on the global supply chain, coupled with geopolitical factors like the Russian-Ukraine conflict, major economies' inflation, has generally risen rapidly. The United States inflation, I'm not sure whether you remember the number or not, peaked at 9.1%. June 2022, and the Eurozone peaked at 10.6% in October 2022. For China, during the pandemic, we adhered to normal monetary policy without drastic easing or contraction. The industrial chain and supply capacity is sound. We maintained smooth operation during the pandemic. Against global high inflation, China's prices have been generally stable with no problems of inflation and deflation. The CPI increases in 2021 and 2022 were 0.9% and 2% respectively. This is to give you a context of uh, recent years. In response to high inflation after the pandemic, major central banks in the United States and Europe have rapidly and intensively adjusted their monetary policies. In a year or so, the Fed has raised interest rates 11 times, raising policy rates by a total of 525 BP. The European Central Bank has risen interest rates 10 times by a total of 450 BP. Such intense interest rate adjustment within such a short period of time is rarely seen in history. The global supply chain has gradually recovered after the pandemic, and commodity prices have generally declined. Inflation in the US and Europe have dropped from the previous high level of about 10% to the current level of about 3%. The rapid and unexpected fall in inflation in developed countries' economies even for many of the central banks of these developed economies, they find such fall unexpected. Such decrease have an impact on China's price level. Inflation of developed economies have dropped from maybe the tenth floor to the third floor, while that of China has dropped from the second floor to the first floor. Domestically, due to insufficient effective demand over capacity in some industries, weak social expectations, and low price levels, the CPI increased by 0.2% in 2023, significantly lower from the previous year. International organizations such as the IMF and other 
institutions predict that China's price level in 2024 will recover moderately as domestic demand continues to improve and external prices and other conditions change. As for your second question, what will the PBOC do in terms of uh, policies? We will strengthen intercyclical and countercyclical adjustments to create a good monetary and financial environment for economic growth and price stability. First, Maintaining price stability and promoting a moderate price recovery should be taken as important factors in monetary policy. We must adhere to the objectives of monetary policy, maintain currency value stability, and promote economic growth. Second, we need to optimize investment and financial resources. We need to guide financial institutions to scientifically assess risks. Curb the financial supply for industries with overcapacity and meet reasonable consumer and financing needs in a more targeted manner. And third, we need to strengthen policy coordination. This is not only an issue about Finance. We need to strengthen synergy of policies to increase residents' income, expand employment, improve social security system, implement consumption-driven strategy, focus on supporting the expansion of domestic demand, promote the matching of supply and demand, and promote a virtuous economic cycle. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you, Economic Daily. China's economy is facing both opportunities and challenges. How will the PBOC grasp a monetary policy direction? Well, I think this question is in the mind of many of you here. This question itself is, of course, important, and there's a lot of tension on China's monetary policy, so I will speak a little slower so that to be more clear. In 2023, China's economy recovered quickly after the smooth transitioning of COVID-19 response. It continued to rebound and improve and enjoyed high-quality development. The annual GDP went up 5.2%, which has been released by the Statistics Bureau. And with that, we've maintained a relatively high growth rate. Despite some difficulties and challenges in our economy, for instance, insufficient effective demand of capacity in some industries, relatively weak expectations and uncertainty in the external environment. Despite all that, from the point of view of the PBOC, there were still many positive and favorable factors. This is why when we look at problems themselves, we also need to take a broader perspective and factor in various circumstances. Over the years, compared with the sharp expansion of monetary policies in developed countries, China's monetary policy have remained relatively stable. Its monetary policy adjustment and guidance mechanisms have continued to improve. And these are conditions created by a sustainable economic growth. There is still sufficient room for China's monetary policy in the next stage, and we will continue to strike a balance between short-term and long-term, between stable growth and risk prevention, between internal and external equilibrium, and we will strengthen counter-cyclical and cross-cyclical adjustments to create a good monetary and financial environment for the economy. Starting from 5th of February the 5th, we will lower the RR by 0.5 percentage points so as to inject 1 trillion RMB liquidity into the market starting from tomorrow 
We will reduce the reloans and rediscounts level by 0.25 percentage points. We will also work to reduce steadily the overall financing cost across the society. So I wish to mainly touch upon the following four areas on what we will do more specifically. First, in terms of the aggregate, we will ensure a reasonable growth. We will continue to use liquidity injection tools such as deposit reserve ratio, reloans and rediscounts, medium term lending facilities and open market operations to provide strong support for the reasonable growth of financing and credit across the society. China's current average statutory reserve ratio is 7.4 percent. Compared with the levels of central banks in other major economies, this is relatively a high percentage point. So for China's PBOC, there's still ample space. And this is an effective tool to supplement the medium and long-term liquidity of the banking system. As I said, the RR ratio will go down 0 0.5 percentage points starting from February the 5th, injecting a liquidity of 1 trillion RMB into the market. Second, in terms of prices, we can say that uh, prices in finance involves two factors, exchange rate and interest rate. In terms of fact prices, we will take into account both internal and external factors. In terms of interest rates, we will continue to put China first. The current price level is still lower than expected price target. Recently, domestic banks have moderately lowered deposit interest rates. For instance, in November and December, you may have noticed that banks in China have lowered the interest rates for savings and starting from 2024. We will continue to push down the cost of corporate financing and consumer credit to lower it from 2% to 1.75%. And as I've mentioned, the reserve requirement ratio for savings policies in this area will also help the LPR to go down. Market, as market believes that adjustment in the Fed's monetary policies will also give China more space for maneuver, more autonomy, as I've mentioned in previous questions. In terms of exchange rate, we will maintain the flexibility of the RM, RMB exchange rate and give full play to the function of the exchange rate as an automatic stabilizer in regulating macroeconomics and balance of payments. We will see to it that the exchange rate is mainly determined by the market, be prepared uh, for worst case scenarios, enrich our response tools and prevent and maintain the basic stability of the RMB exchange rate. Third, in terms of structure, we will improve the structural efficiency and strike a balance between the aggregate and the structure and the existing and the increment. We will focus on the five key areas. We will give favorable policies to small and medium firms. The space for them will be expanded from one, tr one trillion yuan to two trillion yuan. We will also increase the loan support for them, provide special reloans until the end of 2024, and we will cover more targets under the carbon emission reduction support tool. And we will continue to act with market principles and the rule of law, support debt restructuring and other methods to revitalize inefficient financial resources and improve the efficiency of fund use. Fourth, 
We will seek greater synergy in policy coordination. Internationally, China's overall debt, in particular that of the Chinese government, is not high. So there is still relatively ample room for proactive fiscal policies. In the fourth quarter of 2023, we've issued an additional 1 trillion yuan of treasury bonds together with the fiscal budget. And most of this treasury bond will be used in 2024, and tangible outcomes will, can be expected. The current cost of issuing government bonds is low, and the proportion of residents holding government bonds is also low, so there's room for improvement in the purchase of such bonds. Our monetary policy has sufficient conditions to maintain reasonable and sufficient liquidity to provide room for large-scale centralized issuance of government bonds and support the construction of investment projects. Thank you. Next question, please. The question is, on credit issuance in 2023, we saw some relatively big fluctuations at the end of certain quarters and months. So what's your expectations for that in 2024? Since Deputy Governor Xuan Changneng is in charge of relevant departments, I would like to give the floor to him. Thank you. Sorry, from which media? Cover news. Okay, thank you. Market entities and media have great interest in uh, this issue you raised. We have also did some brief and we have also done some brief introduction in our opening remarks. In 2023, the PPOC have uh, given full play to the dual functions of monetary policy in terms of total volume and structure and guide financial in institutions to focus on increasing support for inclusive support technology and other key areas. The balance of RMB loans at the end of 2023 was 237.59 trillion yuan, a year-on-year -year increase of 10.6 percent, and the annual RMB loans increased by 22.75 trillion yuan, an increase of 1.31 trillion yuan year-on-year. We have uh, seen the uh, loan for specialized, advanced, and innovative companies and small and medium-sized tech firms grew by 18.6% and 21.9%. As for manufacturing industry, that grew by 31.9%. With high-tech manufacturing, loans grew by 34%. All of these sectors are higher than the general growth rate of loans of 10.6%. You mentioned that uh, for some quarters and months, We've seen greater fluctuations. For Q1, we usually see more new loans, while April, July, and October, we usually see a smaller amount. Such seasonal patterns are in line with uh, some objective factors. People see that the most important season of the year is uh, spring, and businesses pursue a good start, and large projects usually start at the beginning of the year. We also have a busy spring season for agriculture, and wages and debts are paid off before uh, the spring festival. After we switched COVID protocols, the credit demand accumulated in the past three years has surfaced, resulting in a more obvious surge in loans in Q1 of 2023. Generally speaking, economic recovery requires sustained credit supply. But we need to strike a balance to avoid abnormality. As for 2024, 
Banks have the urge to get off to a good start. And uh, in the second half of last year, the support policies are delivering effects. So we expect to see a relatively rapid growth of uh, credit in Q1. We will maintain a sound pace and we guide financial institutions to do that, to strike a better balance. As for monthly data, we do not need to overread them. We need to take a more diverse perspective. We can take into account the total social financing and also financing costs to see how finance is supporting the real economy. Thank you. Next question, please. Guarding against financial risks, especially systemic risks, is a priority for financial work. What is our considerations in this respect? Thank you. Thank you for your question. In the financial sector, diffusing and preventing financial risks has always been a key theme of ours, and the CPC Central Committee attaches high importance to that. From the Central Economic Work Conference, the Central Financial Work Conference have all made a series of important instructions. So, in light of uh, implementing these instructions and with a broader perspective, I wish to share with you our understandings on diffusing financial risks. First, we need to seek a dynamic balance between economic growth, economic structural adjustment, and financial risks prevention at the macro level. We often say that the economy is the foundation of finance, and finance often mirrors economic development. Many problems in the economy would often spill over from the financial sector and become intertwined with financial risks. To effectively prevent and control risks at the source, the key is to find a balance between economic growth, structural adjustment, and risk prevention. And that is to seek a balance between development, reform, and stability. Second, to strengthen financial supervision, improve financial risk prevention, early warning and disposal mechanisms so as to build a solid financial safety net. And that includes the following. First, to strengthen corporate governance and risk management of financial institutions. Financial institutions, they are the first line of defense to prevent financial risks. Second, we need to strengthen financial supervision, macro prudential management, micro prudential supervision, etc. should each perform their respective duties and form synergy. Third, we need to advance the building of the financial safety net. We need to improve risk monitoring, assessment and early warning improve the early correction mechanism of financial risks with hard constraints, establish a risk disposal mechanism with equal rights and responsibilities and incentives, and give full play to industry security funds, financial stability funds, and strengthen the risk disposal function of deposit insurance. Of course, we need to strengthen legal protection for financial stability and accelerate the introduction of laws and regulations such as the financial stability law. Third, we need to diffuse risks in key areas in an orderly manner. In recent years, a number of outstanding risks have been effectively dealt with, and the overall performance of financial institutions is sound. Since last year, various departments and local governments have taken a number of measures to actively resolve real estate and local debt risks. The financial sectors under our guidance have been lending support to real estate companies, especially leading ones to stabilize their financing channels. In the past couple of days, the PBOC have been working with the state administration for exchange, for foreign exchange.
And we've issued a number of policies for the real estate sector to support competitive real estate markets to make good use of idle funds and increase their liquidity. This document will be issued this evening or maybe tomorrow evening. And in terms of local government debt, local government debt in China are mainly regional, and those facing debt repayment difficulties are mainly a few underdeveloped regions, which have a limited impact on the overall economic and financial aggregates. By the end of November, at the end of November last year, I remember during a meeting held in Hong Kong, I elaborated in detail on this issue. The PBOC going forward will continue to work with relevant industries and local governments to have sound risk mitigation. Fourth, to coordinate financial openness and security and continue to enhance risk prevention and at the same time advance macro opening up. In recent years, we've promoted the opening up of the financial services industry and financial markets in an orderly manner and improved cross-border trade and investment facilitation. Deputy Governor Zhu has also mentioned the, the details on that. Right now, for foreign firms, their hedging rate is at around 25%, so this shows that they have a growing awareness for hedging. And now the use of RMB in cross-border trade has increased to about 25%. It's to 25% are in parallel. One is about hedging, the other is about the use of RMB. So when using the RMB, this means that foreign firms can avoid a mismatch of currencies. And also China's forex market has become more resilient, market entities are more mature and market regulators are more calm and adaptive against market changes. Third, we've promoted international financial cooperation, actively participated in international and multilateral and bilateral dialogue and communication. For instance, we've taken the lead in establishing the China-US and the China-EU financial working groups. We've strengthened macroeconomic policy coordination and tightened the global financial safety net. Just last week, the PBOC, together with the U.S. Treasury, we've held the third China-U.S. Financial Working Group. And at the PBOC, our leading personnel is the Deputy Governor Shen. Improved data security management measures in the financial industry. Cross-border data flow will be safer and more convenient, and rules will be clearer. Next, the PBOC will continue to deliver on the guidance of the CPC Central Committee on risk prevention to guard against systemic risks. So this is my answer, mainly on the four fronts from a broader perspective. Thank you. Next question, please. Good, good afternoon, Market News International. The RMB depreciated against the US dollar in 2023. How does the central bank view the outlook for the RMB exchange rate this year? and what factors might affect the exchange rate. Thank you. Thank美国国际市场新闻社提问。2023年人民币对美元汇率出现贬值。请问央行如何展望今年的人民币汇率表现？有哪些因素可能会影响汇率？谢谢。I think some of the answers uh, have been mentioned in our previous answers. The, uh, the number remained at 2% uh, in terms of uh, onshore. 
In terms of offshore, the number stood at 2.5 percent. Emerging markets currency index was down by 3.8 percent. Our neighbor, the Japanese yen, was down by 7.3 percent, and the Korean currency was down by 2.7 percent. If we put these numbers together, we will get a more comprehensive view. The short-term influencing factors of exchange rates are diverse, such as economic growth, monetary policy, financial markets, geopolitics, risk events, etc. The medium and long-term trends fundamentally depend on economic fundamentals. In 2024, the overall judgment is that the RMB exchange rate will continue to remain basically stable at an adaptive and balanced level. The underpinning factors are as follows. First, the domestic economy is operating steadily. China's economy has good and solid fundamentals and maintains a long-term positive overall trend. This is an important foundation for the basic stability of the RMB exchange rate. And uh, secondly, we notice some changes in external environment, some favorable changes. The market has a high level of uh, consensus on the Fed's monetary policy shift on the weakening of the dollar's appreciation momentum. The misalignment of the monetary policy cycles between China and the United States is expected to be improved, which will facilitate the stabilization and convergence of interest rate differentials between China and the U.S. and help cross-border capital flows and uh, become more balanced. Thirdly, RMB assets have good investment and hedging value. China's financial market continues to open up. As one of the few financial assets with stable prices, RMB bonds are highly attractive for to foreign investors. Since September 2023, the RMB bond market has experienced net capital inflow for four consecutive months. Foreign investors increased the, the domestic bonds held by them by nearly 500 billion yuan. Of course, we have a stronger micro-foundation for exchange rate stability. The international balance of payments is basically balanced. The ratio of current account balance to GDP has remained within a reasonable range. Q th for Q3 last year, the number was 1.6%. Cross-border trade, investment, and financing facilitation continues to improve, and cross-border capital flows are balanced in both directions. The resilience of foreign exchange market has increased. Participants have become more mature. I became the head of uh, SAFE in 2015. Compared with that time, market participants have become much more mature. Exchange rate hedging tools have been more widely used. The international use of RMB has increased rapidly. Operating entities can better respond to external shocks and exchange rate fluctuations. The Central Economic Work Conference and the Central Financial Work Conference emphasized the need to keep the RMB exchange rate basically stable at an adaptive and balanced level. Practice has repeatedly proven that the PBOC and state administration of foreign exchange as regulators of foreign exchange market have the experience, ability, and confidence to respond to various shocks and challenges and maintain the stable operation of foreign exchange market. Going forward, the PBOC and the SAFE will continue to follow the decisions and plans of the Party Central Committee and the State Council adhere to the principle that exchange rate is mainly determined by market supply and demand, maintain the flexibility of the RMB exchange rate, and give full play to the function of exchange rate as an automatic stabilizer in macro regulation and the balance of payments. We will bear in mind our bottom line in rich response to guard against overshooting risks and prevention and prevent the formation of unilateral uh, consistency expectations and their self-fulfillment. In the operation of financial market, 
We often focus on forex market, bond market, and equity market. I think that just now I have uh, shared with you some of my views about how the forex market will look like in 2024. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you my viewpoints about the capital market. The Party Central Committee and the State Council attach great importance to the stability and development of the capital market. The day before yesterday, a meeting of the State Council have made special arrangements, and we have seen the press release. Now China's economy is recovering. We have greater room for maneuvering in terms of macro policy. Capital market has a solid foundation for steady development. The PBOC will implement the meeting of the State Council decisions and plans and strengthen intercyclical and countercyclical adjustment, stabilize the market, stabilize and strengthen confidence and the momentum of recovery and growth to create a good environment for the economy, including the financial market. Thank you. Next question, please. Domestic market interest rate margin are narrowing, and LPR has remained unchanged recently. How will the central bank guide commercial banks to manage their assets and liabilities and effectively promote the reduction of comprehensive social financing costs? I would give the floor to Mr. Xuan for this question. Thank you. Just now, when Governor Pan is answering relevant issues, he has also mentioned some of my answers. I would give a bird's eye view of what the PBOC has done in this respect and our steps going forward. In 2023, the PBOC implemented a series of interest rate policies for a notable reduction in comprehensive social financing costs. One is to lower policy rates twice. In June and August, the open market reverse repo and MLF rates fell by 0.2 percentage points and 0.25 percentage points respectively, driving LPR further down. Second, we have adjusted and optimized housing credit policies. We continue to implement the dynamic adjustment mechanism for first home lending rates and promptly lowered the lower limit of second home lending rates by 40 BP at the end of August and guided banks to lower existing first home lending rates. The third is to further promote marketization of deposit rates against the rapid growth in resident savings deposits and significant decline in lending rates. Major markets have lower deposit rates three times, with medium and longer term deposit rates falling even further. Overall, various measures have effectively pushed corporate financing and household consumer credit costs down significantly. In 2023, the weighted average interest rate of corporate loans was 3.88 percent, a year-on-year -year decrease of 0.29 percentage points, continuing to hit a new lows since statistics were collected. The interest rates of more than 23 trillion yuan of existing mortgage loans have been reduced with an average decrease of uh, 0.73 percentage points, reducing borrowers' interest expenses by approximately 170 billion yuan per year. The overall decline in interest rate has effectively reduced the interest burden of enterprises and residents, helped stimulate credit demand, optimized allocation of financial resources, and better smoothed, smoothened the domestic economic cycle. We have taken multiple measures to reduce financing costs. Going forward, the PBOC will continue to 
in harm the pertinence and synergy of interest rate policies through reform, focus on our policy objectives, and balance various factors, and further leverage the role of interest rate policy in promoting consumption, stabilizing investment, and expanding domestic demand. The first is to ensure a reasonable level of interest rate based on judgment of future price changes, where we will develop a forward-looking understanding of the actual interest rate level to keep it consistent with the requirements for achieving potential economic growth. Second, is to comprehensively consider the relationship between deposit rates, financial management yields, dividend yield, etc. Better leverage the market-based adjustment mechanism of deposit rates, support banks in reducing liability costs while maintaining a reasonable and orderly market competition environment and create conditions for lowering lending rates. Third, is to encourage banks to increase sales of government bonds to residents, not only to provide residents with more investment channels that combine safety, profitability, and flexibility, but also to further unblock the diversified channels for converting savings into investment. Fourth, on that premise of maintaining the bank's ability to support the sustainability of the real economy and prevent and resolve risks, we will improve the LPR formation mechanism and urge banks to improve quality. We will strengthen lending rate monitoring and self-discipline management to prevent corporate sector from simply circulating funds in the financial sector for arbitrage. The fifth is to implement a dynamic adjustment management a mechanism for first home mortgage rate policies, work with local government to adjust the lower limit of policy interest rate according to local conditions, optimize the relationship between interest rates of personal loans such as home mortgage, consumer loans and business loans, and support stable and healthy operation of the real estate market. In addition, the PBOC will continue to cooperate with relevant departments to regulate banks on reasonable service charges on companies, urge banks to further reduce service fees to effectively reduce enterprises' financing costs. Thank you. Next question, please. With CCTV, the central government has proposed to accelerate the building of a country with a strong financial sector. How will the PBOC implement that? Thank you for your question. Let me briefly answer your question. Since the 18th CPC National uh, Congress, China's financial system reform has made major progress. We have made headway in building a modern financial adjustment system, financial supervision system, financial institution system, financial product and service system, and financial infrastructure system, and the ability of finance to serve the real economy and prevent and control risks has been significantly enhanced. With China's international political and economic status enhances, the international influence of the PBOC and the level of RMB internationalization have been greatly elevated. These have led a solid foundation for building a country with a strong financial sector. At present, China's banking sector ranks first in the world in terms of asset size. Its bond market size ranks second in the world, and its foreign exchange reserves have ranked first in the world for 19 consecutive years. Digital finance, green finance, and inclusive finance are at the forefront of uh, the world. The RMB ranks third in the IMF Special Joint Rights Currency Basket, and more than 80 countries and economies have included the RMB as a reserve currency. Building a country with a strong financial sector is a long-term goal and a systematic project. It requires adhering to the basic logic of the market, rule of law, and takes an international approach and longer-term effects, uh, long, longer-term efforts. We must continue to pursue reform of the socialist market economy and enhance the function of the financial market in allocating resources. We need to continue to improve the financial rule of law and enhance the transparency, stability, and predictability of financial systems and policies. We need to coordinate profound financial reform and high-standard financial opening up, continue to promote the opening up of the financial services industry and financial markets, enhance trade, investment, and financing facilitation, and strengthen financial security capacity, building financial capacity building that adapts to the level of openness. General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out that a country with a strong financial sector should have six key core financial elements and emphasized that it should have a strong currency and a strong central bank. 
Currency is the foundation of the financial sector and a comprehensive reflection of a nation's national strength, international competitiveness, and macro governance capabilities. A strong currency can better fulfill its functions as a measure of value, a means of circulation, a means of payment, and a means of storage. Enhance the confidence of currency holders, meet the needs of opening up and cross-border investment and financing, and provide favorable currency and financial environment for the healthy and stable development of the national economy. We will focus more on achieving the dual goals with dual pillars, that is, improving the dual pillar regulatory framework of monetary policy and macro prudential policy, and achieving the dual goals of currency stability and financial stability. We will accelerate the building of a modern central bank system around responsibilities such as monetary policy, systemic financial risk prevention and control, financial stability and national financial security, international financial governance and cooperation, financial markets, financial infrastructure construction, financial management, and Services. We will continue to promote financial supply side structural reform, optimize the structure and layout of the financial institution system and financial markets, and accelerate the building of a modern financial system with Chinese characteristics. The PBOC also assumes important responsibilities in building strong financial institutions, strong international financial centers, strong financial supervision, and a strong team of financial talents. We will uphold the centralized and unified leadership of the Party Central Committee on Financial Work, deeply understand the political implications, and policy uh, and people-oriented nature of financial work, firmly pursue the path of financial development with Chinese characteristics, take concrete steps, continue to promote high-quality financial development, and vigorously promote building a country with a strong financial sector. Thank you. Next question, please. Twenty-first century economy. At present, small and micro enterprises are showing uneven recovery. What further measures can be taken in terms of financial support for the private sector to better stimulate the development vitality of business entities? I give the floor. To Governor Zhu, thank you for your question. Just now, Governor Pan mentioned two major measures to serve the private sector's development. Supporting the development of the private economy is consistent policy of the Party Central Committee, and the private economy is an important part of our country's economic system in terms of stabilizing growth, promoting innovation, increasing uh, innovation, increasing, uh, increasing employment, and improving people's livelihood. They play a very important role. We often mention six, seven, eight, nine as indicators of how important the private sector is in China's economy. The PBOC has done a lot in this regard. First, in terms of uh, philosophy and approach, I believe that you know that we have the policy of uh, too unswervingly supporting the development of the private sector, treating them as equals uh, with SOEs. Besides philosophy, we also take concrete actions. Through financial institutions, we have implemented our policies to deliver benefits to the private sector so that it can become an important engine and source of growth for our economy. We have made much progress in this regard. Over the years, the problem of financing difficulties have been effectively addressed. At the end of last year, the balance of loans to privately held enterprises was over 41.2 trillion yuan, an increase of 3.8 trillion yuan, an increase of 1 trillion yuan year on year. We, the number of entities increased by over 1 million. The average interest rate was 
about 10%, 23 BP down by uh, compared with last year. The five priorities mentioned in the recent meeting, most of them are related to the private sector. And the PBOC will focus on the following areas. Uh, first, we will focus on policy incentives. We are developing more tools. The, major, the two major initiatives and measures we have mentioned are part of our policy tools and they will be implemented by our financial institutions. The requirements of the private sector and the financial institutions need to be aligned, for example, due diligence and other areas so that our policies can better deliver. And the second is we need to develop a stronger capability to provide services. We can help them develop keen understandings on some issues they didn't notice, for example, on credit loan or on their first loan. We can share more information on that. And third, we need to diversify fund supply. For example, we can issue some direct bond in terms of uh, that, and uh, some uh, high-quality private sector enterprises, how they can access finance and funds in turn, uh, by the capital market. We also attach great importance to that. As for SciTech firms, we support them by issuing credit and issuance of relevant notes. In different links, capital raising, investment, management, and exit, we provide better services for private enterprises. We will play a bigger role in this regard. Thank you. Next question, please. In the interest of time, we will have the last question. Phoenix TV, what has the PBOC done in terms of promoting high standard opening up in Hong Kong and how to better integrate Hong Kong into national development? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Over the past years, almost every year, the PBOC and relevant authorities in Hong Kong have worked together on implementing a number of major initiatives and projects. High standard opening up is a fundamental state policy of China's. Hong Kong is a main international financial hub. It is the largest offshore IMB market. It is also the most important asset management center, personal wealth management center in Asia. So the PBOC has always supported Hong Kong in building an offshore IMB center. We've enabled the mainland financial sector to help with Hong Kong's high level opening up, protected Hong Kong's status as the international financial center and contributed to the long-term prosperity and stability in Hong Kong. Over the years, the PBOC together with mainland financial management departments have rolled out and improved a number of arrangements, including the Hong Kong Shenzhen Shanghai Stock Connect, Bond Connect, the Cross-Border Wealth Management Connect, Swap Connect, etc. These arrangements have provided convenience for overseas investors to buy mainland stocks and bonds for Hong Kong and for Hong Kong citizens to purchase mainland financial products. 
to further the high-level opening up of the financial sector in the mainland and deepen financial cooperation between the mainland and Hong Kong and elevate Hong Kong's position as the international financial hub, the PPOC and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority with sound preparations have decided to roll out six policy measures. I'll give the floor to Deputy Governor Xuan to introduce, to brief you on the six measures. He's in charge of the international affairs in the PBOC. So I'll say a few words on deepening cooperation between Hong Kong and the mainland. The six measures are rolled out, are to be rolled out by both the PBOC and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. They involve market connectivity, cross-border facilitation for funds and deepening financial cooperation. And they can be summed up with three connections and three conveniences. First, bonds will be covered by the qualified by the QFI and also bond connect will be further enhanced. Third, the cross-border wealth management for the greater for the Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, Greater Bay Area. Fourth, in the Greater Bay Area, for Hong Kong and Macau citizens, they will have more convenience to purchase homes to better meet their needs for home buying. Fifth, to expand the pilot program regarding financing Hong Kong and Macau, and six is to provide more convenience to citizens both in the mainland and in Hong Kong and Macau for financing. So going forward, the PBOC will work with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to make sure that these policy measures are delivered well with real effects to further enhance our cooperation and services in terms of the financial sector and help Hong Kong's development as the international financial center. So we will work with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority to deliver on these six measures of opening up. Already a lot of preparations has been done. The policy document on the six measures will be introduced tonight by the PBOC, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and relevant departments. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. This is the end of today's press conference.